Okay, I think um, maybe we'll go ahead and begin now. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. Um, uh, I'm Regina Jorgensen, the Director of Astronomy here at the Mariah Mitchell Association. And I'd like to thank you for tuning in to tonight's science speaker presentation. First, I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors for this presentation at Climate, Cisco Brewers, the Osceola Foundation and Nantucket Island Resorts and their support has helped to make these kinds of events possible. Um, I'd also, I'm gonna put in a quick plug here for our next week's um, Science Speaker Series, Wednesday at 7 p.m. And we will be welcoming Jimmy Elliott, who will discuss the life history and population dynamics of green crabs. Um, so a few programmatic notes to begin um, about tonight's event. This event is actually gonna be slightly longer than our typical one hour Science Speaker Series that we plan to end around 8.30 or so. Um, if you need to leave early, um, don't worry about it. You can just sign off. Um, but if you'd also like to rewatch anything, if you missed anything, or if you'd like to share it with your friends or family, um, we will be posting the recording of this event on our YouTube channel likely tomorrow. So it's my really great pleasure to introduce the Mariah Mitchell Observatory 2020 National Science Foundation Research Experience for Undergraduate Interns. Um, and I'd like to actually begin by giving a huge thank you to the National Science Foundation that has actually made this entire program possible and for their continued support of the Mariah Mitchell Association's NSF REU site. Um, we are especially grateful for their flexibility and their support during these very challenging times. Um, tonight, you're actually going to be treated to hearing about a range of different astrophysical research projects spanning a very wide range of topics, including the search for life on other planets, um, understanding the life cycles of stars, unraveling the cosmic web, and even taking a closer look at what happens when a star wanders too close to a black hole. These are all the projects, or some of the projects that our research interns have been working on this summer at the Mariah Mitchell Association, virtually, of course. Um, and as you might suspect, this summer has brought some unique challenges to the MMO's NSFREU program. While we began the summer with the hope that we could eventually bring the interns to Nantucket, the pandemic had other plans for us. And we have pivoted to an entirely remote program with all of the interns working from their hometowns um, via many hours on Zoom and Slack and email. And while some of the normal aspects of our summer program here, like open nights and things like that, of course, have not been possible, um, the astrophysics research has been amazingly successful, and you will see some of that tonight. I'd like to especially thank the affiliated astronomers who are seen here on the screen, um, who have helped in mentoring the interns this summer, um, and thank them for their flexibility in this kind of challenging summer, um, and of course for all of their amazing work in helping um, to mentor the intern projects this summer. I'd also like to thank the current MMO Research Fellow, Jay Chitidi, and the MMO Telescope Engineer and Astronomer, Gary Walker, for their irreplaceable help um, for the entire summer and as always in mentoring this summer's cohort. Uh, none of this would have been possible without them. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to thank the Mariah Mitchell Association for helping to make this program possible. Um, with that, we'll now begin the presentations. Just a few notes I'd like to mention. Um, these presentations are not actually the final research presentations, but rather more like informational status updates on each intern's project. The interns are actually continuing to work on the projects for several more weeks, and then they'll be preparing uh, poster presentations in the coming semester that they'll present at the American Astronomical Society National Meeting in January of 2021. Um, just a few logistical notes. Each intern will present for about eight minutes, and then we will have a couple of minutes for questions afterwards. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to write it into the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom or maybe the top of your screen. And um, you can also raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question verbally, and we can unmute you at the end of the presentation. Um, at the end of all six presentations, we'll actually stick around. So if you have some more general questions or questions that you didn't get in in the, um, in the breaks between presentations, um, don't worry. We will stick around and take all of the questions um, at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'd just like to um, start off by welcoming our first presenter, who is uh, Kiana Burton from Temple University. 
and she will be presenting on Epsilon Eridani, Probing Planetary Habitability Using ALMA. And I think I have to stop screen sharing so that Kiana can see. Um, so hi, I'm Kiana and I'll be talking about probing planetary habitabil habitability using ALMA um, and using a nearby star, Epsilon Iridon. So first I wanna start off with this question, are we alone in the universe? Um, this is a really big question and 25 years or so, 25 years ago or so, we would have started by asking, are there other planets that orbit other stars like the Earth and the other planets in our solar system orbit the sun? Um, we've come a long way from 25 years. The answer is yes. In fact, there are over 4,000 confirmed extrasolar planets, and there are thousands more just waiting to be confirmed. Um, and so the question today really is, are those planets habitable? This simulation you've been watching here is pretty much an illustration of 1,700 of the planets that Kepler has found. Kepler is a space-based telescope. Um, it's retired now. But these 1,700 planets are orbiting 685 stars, and their orbits are to scale. So you can pretty much compare how these planets revolve around their star to how the planets in our solar system revolve around the sun. Um, and even on the left upper corner of the screen, you can see the color uh, with blue being more Earth-like and cooler and red being more lava-like. Okay, and so how do we investigate planetary habitability? Well, this is also a really big question and it is largely interdisciplinary work. I wanna emphasize that which just means it can be approached from many different avenues of science. Um, but from an astrophysical point of view, we can look at the behavior of the star. So stars can be quite violent, um, and that just means that they can do things like flare. Uh, these flares can release harmful radiation and energetic particles that will bombard a planet's atmosphere. And these, these particles and uh, these rays can break apart the important molecules in a planet's atmosphere, over time eroding it. So if you're wondering why atmospheres are important, um, so if you're wondering why atmospheres are important, you can think about the Earth's for context. We have a ozone layer, which is responsible for shielding out some ultraviolet radiation. So you can really put into perspective why atmospheres are important the planets if they are going to harbor life. I'm having trouble switching the slide. Okay, here we are. So let's look at the um, electromagnetic spectrum for a bit. So down here you can see that as the wavelength changes, right, as it goes from longer to shorter, the type of radiation changes. So we have radio waves, which are the longest, all the way to gamma rays, which are the shortest. And flares will actually emit energy across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And each of these different wavelengths that a flare might emit can tell us a little bit, it can give a bit, uh, a different piece of the puzzle to what's going on behind a flare. But if we just look at radio waves, um, more specifically, a subset of that, which is the millimeter wavelength, we can um, study some cool things about particle acceleration in flares. And this is also really exciting because, it, as it turns out, millimeter wavelengths have been largely unexplored in astrophysics, in astrophysics um, millimeter wavelengths and flaring. And so this gives us new opportunities for probing particle acceleration. Okay. So how would we detect millimeter emission? ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, is a radio telescope located in Chile. This is an image of the ALMA array. Um, and as it turns out, as the wavelength of the radiation that you're trying to um, observe gets longer, it just requires that the telescope have, has an, entire, an, an absurdly large diameter towards dish. And to get around this, 
ALMA is able to function as an interferometer. And what that just means is that it has many different antennas that work together to pretty much function as a larger telescope whose diameter is equal to the distance between them. So on here, right here, I have an illustration. Um, so if there's a star, the astronomical signal will hit each of the antennas, and these signals will get combined in something called the correlator. Okay, so this summer, I've been focusing on a nearby star called Epsilon Iridani, and I've been um, researching to find out if it flares in the millimeter wavelength. So just some background, it is part of the Iridondas constellation. You can see the star here in the constellation. Um, it's about 10 and a half light years away. It, it's actually a sun-like star. Here's an artist's impression of Epsilon Iridani compared to the sun. Um, you can see that it's much younger. It's actually 400 to 800 million years old while the sun is 5 billion years old. Um, and I actually really do want to emphasize that flaring in the millimeter regime is quite an unexplored area of astrophysics. Uh, for example, we've only known that maybe smaller stars that are dimmer than Epsilon Iridani, that we've only known that they flare in the millimeter wavelength for about two years. OK. So this is an image that I've made from uh, uh, the data that I've been working with this summer. And this is from OMA data, right? And what this just represents is the brightness in the millimeter averaged over a total of four and a half hours of observations. That's really cool, but if we want to find a flare, we have to take that image I just showed you apart. Um, and so we can look at the brightness as a function of time for variations. And here's a graph, we call this a light curve. There is time on the x-axis and bright, uh, brightness on the y. And we can see that the, the brightness as time um, goes on is not uniform. There are some low points, there are some higher points, and there's a peak. Um, and this is how we pretty much characterize a flare. On the right is a GIF that I have, and it is comparing um, a smaller peak to this larger peak here. Um, and you can see that the bright, you can see the brightness change visually. And this is also really exciting because this represents the first millimeter flare detected in Epsilon Iridani. Okay, so um, what have we learned? First, understanding flares is a way to investigate planetary habitability. Next, flaring in the millimeter wavelengths has been an unexplored area of astrophysics, yet these wavelengths are really promising for probing particle acceleration. And lastly, we now know that stars like Epsilon Iridani flare in the millimeter wavelength. Um, thank you, it has been an amazing summer. First, I wanna thank everyone for listening to me and a special thanks to the MMA and Dr. Meredith McGregor at CU Boulder for being my research advisor this summer. Um, and with that, I am happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you, Tiana. Um, I will start off with a question of my own and give anybody a second if they have, if they have any questions, feel free to write it into the Q&A. Oh, actually, we do have one um, hand raised. Why don't I, I, I'll go there first. Let me see if I can. Uh, oh, it's Suvi. Um, Suvi actually has a question, and I'm going to unmute you, Suvi. I think it'll pop up a little thing for you, for you to accept that, and then you can talk. OK, can you hear me? I hear you. A wonderful presentation. Um, I was curious, and I'm not so familiar with ALMA observations, but I was wondering why the star wasn't in the center of the beam or the field oh, of view. That's a good question. Let me just, having trouble switching that up. Okay. Oh, okay. So you can pretty much, you can pretty, uh, have a, you can um, have the pointing of the antenna change. And so in these observations, this is actually data taken from ALMA's archive. Um, this was originally intended to observe the northern arc of the debris disk. I didn't really talk too much about the debris disk of Epsilon Iridani, but it has one. 
um, and I have my pointer like circling it here. So the pointing position is about 18 degrees north of the star. And so that's why it's not in the center of the image. But I, for the purpose of my research, I've just been looking at the star. Great, thanks. <laughs> Um, let's see, we have, oh, we do have one question um, from Louise. Hello, Louise. Um, and the question is, what drew you to astrophysics? And also she says, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I've been a fan of astrophysics, astrophysics just because um, I really think that when we look at things in space, we can kind of see like, for example, we can see subatomic particles in more extreme environments. And so I think that I just have always thought that the cosmos is a really good environment for studying um, phenomenon. And so that's pretty much what drew me to astrophysics. Awesome. That's great. Yana, I'm going to ask my question, um, which is, um, do you want to tell us just a little bit more about why Epsilon Eridani uh, might be of interest to astronomers? What is it in particular about this star? Yeah. Um, so something, a reason why this would be interesting is not, um, I think I mentioned before that Epsilon Eridani is like a sun-like star. It's younger, but um, this image, there's kind of a lot going on, but what you can see here is our solar system compared to the Epsilon Eridani system, and um, if you look closely at them, they're pretty much similar. Like in our solar system, we have a Kuiper belt, um, there's a comet belt for Epsilon Eridani, and it even has like a gas giant planet that we've confirmed, so Epsilon Eridani B, which is comparable to Jupiter and some other proposed planets. But basically by observing Epsilon Eridani, we can actually learn more about how planets form around sun-like stars. Um, and because it's younger, we can also learn a lot about maybe what our sun or how our planetary system would have looked when it was younger. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, um, I think we have one more question in the Q&A. Um, uh, Deborah and Robert are asking, um, is there a correlation between the age of a star and the habitability of an orbiting planet? Uh, um, that's a great question. So in terms of the habitability of the orbiting planet, so that would depend on many factors. Um, for example, if that orbiting planet is in the, habit in the habitable zone, which just refers to the zone at which that planet will be able to develop liquid on its surface, um, and also a lot of other factors. For reference, I think we have found most of the planets in the habitable zone around something called M dwarfs, which are a type of star. They, um, I don't really know the exact size of those stars, but yeah. Um, in a way, yes, but we're still learning a lot more about that. I hope I was able to answer part of that question. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you. In the interest of time, we'll move on um, to the next presenter. But if you didn't, if you think of a question and you'd still like to ask it, feel free to um, either pop it in the Q&A or um, at the end of the presentation, we'll go back and you'll have a chance to ask anyone any questions you didn't ask. Um, so our next presenter is Alex Granados from Wellesley College. And Alex is going to be telling us about um, using test data to search for exoplanets around white dwarfs. Can you guys see my screen all right? Okay. Yes, we do. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Regina. Um, hi, as mentioned, I'm Alex Granados. I was paired with Dr. JJ Hermes at Boston University to use data from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, to search for exoplanets around white dwarfs. To start, let's talk about exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets that are orbiting around stars other than our own. Many, there are many different ways to identify exoplanets, but the method that is by far the most effective is the transit method. In this method, a telescope is pointed at a star, continually taking data regarding its brightness over time. When the planet passes in front of the star, the planet blocks out some of the light from the star 
um, the transit of the planet appears as a dip in brightness in the graph. The Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, is a telescope in space that is surveying the whole sky looking for exoplanet transits. Kiana mentioned the Kepler Space Telescope mission. Uh, TESS is, the, is intended to be the next generation for planet hunting in space. Launched in April of 2018, it has been taking data for a little over two years and has completed its first pass around the whole sky. To do this, TESS divides the sky into 24 sectors. It observes each sector for a month, for about a month before moving on to the ne next sector. TESS was designed to look at bright, bright stars that are easy to follow up with ground-based telescopes, but it proved very capable at showing fainter objects as well. And this brings me to the focus of my summer research, white dwarfs. White dwarfs are the end state of most stars. When a low mass star like our sun is in the red giant phase of its evolution and has used up all its fuel for nuclear fusion, it begins to shed its outer layers and leaves behind the core of the star. The leftover core is a white dwarf. They are about the same size as Earth, but 200,000 times heavier. Because there is no more nuclear fusion, white dwarfs are also faint. There are, there are predicted to be a fair amount of planets that have survived through their host star's transition. However, men, we have only detected, about, only detected two planets transiting around white dwarfs. Thus, my research has focused on looking through the test data at known white dwarfs, hoping to find a detected planet transit. A planet transit will look a bit different for white dwarfs compared to other stars. As previously mentioned, white dwarfs are very small, so a planet passing in front of a white dwarf would be a lot quicker as there isn't as much distance to cover. The results in the dip in brightness would look more like a V dip depicted on the right compared to the long U shaped dip depicted on the left. I was given the task of looking at thousands of observations of nearly 2,000 white dwarfs all across all 24 sectors of test data. After meticulously analyzing every observation, only a handful of possible exoplanet transits were identified, one of which I'll share with you now. To the left is a small section of the test sector observed that has the white dwarf target we were looking at. Using the pixels highlighted in pink and circled in red, I generated the light curve seen on the right. Um, as you can see, it has a very nice V dip that occurs for a short time in the period of this event, making the prospect of a planet orbiting around this white dwarf very promising. Now, sadly, this isn't actually a white dwarf that is making up the light curve. TESS doesn't have very fine resolution, so multiple stars can end up in the same pixels. To the right now is an image of, with the same field of view as the TESS frame is showing, but with a different survey that has a high resolution. Circled in red is the white dwarf target we were hoping to find a planet around, and circled in blue is the star which is causing the change in brightness, a very variable star already cataloged. The star is incorporated into the larger test aperture during analysis, resulting in a lookalike transit event. This is unfortunately a common trend in planet hunting for tests, making follow-up extremely important. So we didn't find any definitive exoplanet transits around white dwarfs this summer, but there was a mystery that had me scratching my head for, for weeks, and I'd like to share that with you in the last couple of minutes. We found the exact opposite of what we were looking for this summer, a periodic peak with no obvious cause. To the left is the small section of the test sector observed that has the white dwarf target we were looking at. Using the pixels highlighted in pink and circled in red, I generated the light curve uh, that shows a blip event seen on the right. None of the theories we came up with to explain the blips were fitting the observed event, so we checked the background to see if the event was happening there as well. And it was, with the same period and strength we thought there could be, um, with the same period and strength. We thought there could be an issue with tests, and all the known systematic variations were not lining up with what we found either. So we started to get exciting, thinking we found some new issue to watch out for when looking at faint targets. But we then realized while going through the pixels again and checking the light curves that in the bright spot in the lower left corner circled in red, there is an eclipsing binary with deep transit events that has the exact same period as our blips. An eclipsing binary is similar to exoplanet transits, except it's another star passing in front of the target star instead of a planet. This means that the blips we're seeing are resulting from an oversubtraction of the light emanating from this bright eclipsing binary. So thankfully, what would have been a hard to correct issue for tests turned out to be nothing too serious. In summary, white dwarfs are the small, dense, leftover cores of stars. Theory and observations predict a larger number of planets around white dwarfs than currently detected, 
False positive signals are abundant, so white dwarf planet signals and tests require careful scrutiny. Um, and this summer, after looking through thousands of observations of white dwarfs, we didn't find any definitive exoplanet transits, but we will continue to search for these elusive targets. Thank you to Regina for leading this summer program, JJ for advising me this summer, Jay, Gary, and all the summer interns for making this experience unforgettable. Thank you. And with that, I'll take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, if we have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or pop them in the Q&A. And uh, while people are thinking, um, I'll actually ask you a question. Oh, actually, I see one pop up. Let me um, take that. Oh, that's Louise saying, um, good job doing the hard work of sciencing. And indeed, <laughs> it's very true. One of the most important parts of science is to figure out when you have false detections and to make sure that you're not um, inaccurately claiming a detection of something like a planet. So that's what that was really at the heart of a lot of the work this summer. Um, the whole sky has so far been surveyed by TESS. Um, so does that mean that your project is done for now or, or is there more work? Um, it, uh, there, there should be more work to continue. Um, planet detection is difficult around white dwarfs as laid out before. Um, and uh, after, the, after low mass stars puff up and become the right white red giants, they, they kind of uh, eat the, the smaller uh, planets orbiting close in nearby. And with the test data, with only one month of observation, I was able to, um, I was able to look at stars that have periodic up, um, um, dips for only less than three days. And so with more observations, I'll be able to look at hopefully uh, more longer periods. Awesome. Um, we have another question from uh, Jamie, who's asking, when our sun transitions to a white dwarf, do we have any indication of whether planets in our solar system will survive? Very interesting question. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, uh, so the, when the, our star transitions to a red giant, it should come up right, uh, I've seen different things saying it'll eat Earth, it might not eat Earth, um, Mars might be safe, uh, but all of the planets outside of the asteroid belt should hopefully, will probably survive. Um, and so when our star transitions to a white dwarf, Earth will probably be gone, but um, a lot of the gas giants we have will stay safe. Awesome. I guess that's good to know if we want to move to Jupiter. <laughs> um, we have one more question actually from Tharni, hello, who's saying, um, first of all, great talk. Uh, regarding known planets that orbit white dwarfs, how far away from, uh, how far away are they from their host star? Um, I'm curious about that because like you said, they have to survive the host star's evolution. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, remember how far away they are from their host star. I know um, one of them is a, is a very, it's a, I think it's pretty far away because it's a 25 five day long transit um, event instead of a short. So it's like a lot of debris from like a, uh, uh, you know, like a collision or something. So it isn't an actual intact planet and neither is the other one. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's more the like destruction of planets that have been detected so far. Um, cool. We have a couple more questions. Um, Asia is asking, what do we know about how exoplanets are affected by other stars moving in front of the star they orbit around? I wonder if, uh, I'm not sure if that means if it's in a, if, if Asia is asking if, if the star is in a binary and so there's another star there or if Asia is referring to maybe passing in the line of the site, but not actually mm. associated with the system. Um, yeah, um, both have been uh, issues. Um, I uh, when I uh, at during the school year, I worked at um, doing follow up for tests, and so we've we've come across a lot of eclipsing binaries that have we we call. It, planet killing. And so we're, we <laughs> have killed many of planets. I think I've personally killed five um, <laughs> because they were eclipsing binaries or near or other stars nearby that were eclipsing binaries. Um, and the single one-off 
uh, uh, debris or some or another star passing in front of a star that has happened as well. And so that is an issue. Um, <laughs> Great. Uh, we have one more question. Rudy is asking, um, any signs of non-exoplanet variability from white dwarfs in the test light curves? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, there is uh, a lot of, not a lot, white dwarfs are mostly stable, but um, they have at a specific point in their um, cooling down, they uh, reach a stage where there's um, the hydrogen is able to like ionize and, and stop ionizing and then reionize. And so it, it creates these pulsations in the star. Um, and so there's a pulsators at that specific instability strip. Um, and uh, they also have uh, like sunspots like um, our star that are cool, but they like take up a lot large portion of the star, about 40% of the star. And so those are also um, create variability and then some of them are binaries so yeah awesome thank you so much that was fantastic thank you and again if you do have more questions about um either of the presentations we've had already feel free to hang on to them till the end um and we'll come back to open it up to everyone again um, um our next speaker is devin barros from bridgewater state university and Devin is going to be talking tonight about de-blurring images of a pulsar wind nebula. All right, thank you, Machina, for the introduction. Right, just loading for one second, hold on. All right, here we go. So for my summer research, I've been attempting to de-blur images of a pulsar wind nebula, like Regina said. On the right of your screen, you can see a multi-wavelength image of a pulsar wind nebula, and I'll explain more what these words mean as I go on. So you're probably wondering, what exactly is a pulsar wind nebula? I mean, I didn't even know when I first started this project. For starters, we can dissect its name by going through its individual words, starting with its first word, pulsar. What's a pulsar? Well, when a high mass star dies, it can do one of a few things. Like you saw in Alex's presentation, he said that when a low mass star dies and go into a white dwarf and fades away. In this instance, something much more energetic happens. When the high mass star is dying and gravity is crushing it, the protons and electrons within that star's core are actually forced to fuse. So these positive negative charges come together to create neutrons. And this happens all throughout the star's core and creates a very energetic, very dense, yet very cosmically small object about the size of a small city back here on Earth. This object is called a neutron star. On your screen now is an artist's impression of a neutron star. These blue lines that you're seeing are its intense magnetic field. You can't actually see them, they're just an interpretation. And these purple things on the two sides of the image are these jets of radiation and light that are spewing from this neutron star because of how energetic it is. And this object also spins at a very fast rate. It's mostly due to its conservation of angular momentum because it went from a very, very wide object to a very compact object in the matter of seconds, like a figure skater bringing its arms in to make itself spin faster. The same thing is happening in outer space yet on a very cosmic scale. And back here on Earth, when we observe this object, we see a pulse because these jets of material are pointing at us then away, at and away, almost like a lighthouse, but spinning really, really fast, which is why we call it a pulsar. Another consequence of this neutron star forming is that the magnetic fields interact with the surrounding medium, so like the gas and the dust that's sitting around this star, neutron star, and this interaction creates what we call a pulsar wind nebula. On your screen now is an image from the Chandra X-ray telescope of the pulsar wind nebula that I'm studying. You probably can't see it, but it's a very small white dot in the middle. That's the actual pulsar. The smaller white circle is the pulsar wind nebula, and this bigger circle is what's called a supernova remnant or just the leftover material from when the star first explodes. Now these kind of objects can be seen through multiple wavelengths of light. And what I mean by that is that light is one part of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum like we saw in Kiana's presentation. And this characteristic wavelength can be seen on your screen now. You've probably seen this in most of your middle school classes. And just to give you a quick little refresher from Kiana's presentation, on your right, uh, excuse me, left, you have radio, microwave, then infrared, 
and radio is seen in Kian's presentation. And these are longer wavelengths and more low energy events happen here. Then you have visible light, which is what we see every day. Then we have ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray. And these are all shorter wavelengths and higher energy events and objects. For my purposes, I'm focusing on the X-ray regime because my object happens to emit mostly through X-rays. Now, unfortunately, I can't just pull out any old telescope from my closet and look at this object through X-rays in outer space because the X-ray wavelength is so short that it'll just pass right through your animal mirror. So we have to build specific telescopes to see these objects in space. And we have to launch these telescopes into space as well because X-rays cannot penetrate through Earth's atmosphere. On your screen now are some examples of X-ray telescopes. In the middle, we have Chandra. On the left, you have XMM. In the right, you have Hitomi. And these are all wonderful telescopes. They do amazing things. But the telescope that I'm gathering data from is a telescope called New Star. On your screen now is a model of New Star. On the right side, you have the optics. In the middle, you have a 10 meter, 30 foot, about long mast to give them a nice long focal length. And on the left is the actual X-ray detectors that take in the X-rays and gather the data. Now, New Star is great in one aspect, but not so great in another aspect. The great thing is that it can see a very broad and high energy range, or brightness, if you will, of certain objects. To give you an example of what I mean, I'm going to be comparing Chandra's energy range and New Star's energy range on this number line. For Chandra, you can see a range of around 0.5 to 10 keV. And keV in this instance is just the unit of energy. Now compared to this number line, the range of Chandra is kind of small. But with New Star's range, it can see from 3 to 80 keV, around eight times of what Chandra can see. And this is one of the great aspects of New Star. The only problem is that it sacrifices having a nice looking image. Take a look on your screen now on the left of these beautiful tigers. You can see the stripes, the way their eyes are looking, the background is very clear. It's a nice, clear, and detailed image. And that's what a perfect telescope would see. And then you have images like the one on the right of your screen, where you can probably tell that there's some sort of animal or animals in the photo, but you can't see their stripes, their eyes are gone, the background's a blur. It's all just a blurry mess. And unfortunately, D-Star gives off more of this blurry looking image. And my job is to make this blurry image turn into this more clear, detailed image through a process called deconvolution. In a nutshell, this process takes your object that you're studying or the point source and makes it more prominent while it's making the variations and blurs in the background less prominent. To kind of explain more of what I mean, here's a cartoon that I made specifically for this presentation, just to show you guys what deconvolution does in a more simple way. On your left, you have this triangle, which is my object, suppose an object in this case, and these small lines are these variations that I don't really want. When I deconvolve this, moving to the right, I'm squeezing or sucking up this point source so that's more prominent. So as you can see, the peak in the middle here is higher than the one on the left, and the number of lines on the side also decrease. So before there's around six on each side, now there's three, that's great. The problem is when I over deconvolve this, yes, the object is very, very prominent, but the variations also meld together and create fake sources. And as you can see, the variation now is now the same height practically as the point source. And that's what I don't want. So it's finding that balance between not over deconvolving, but still deconvolving enough to have a nice image to study and analyze. As for my results, I created this energy cut image that you're seeing on your screen now. And I created this over the summer. And as you can see, it's convolved, it's blurry. You can't really see much. It's not yet deconvolved. For my purposes, I deconvolved what's now in that red box. And for my results, on the right of your screen now is my actual deconvolved image of the pulsar nebula that I'm studying. You can see that this circular looking, looking object in the middle is the, the object. And you can still see some little variations in the background that could be part of just the image or the coding, but it's enough where it's a nice, clearer and sharper image that I can actually study and analyze and try and find out new things about. What I'm trying to do now currently in my research is figuring out maybe what these little flares are on the side. Are they part of the image or are they actually part of the object? I'm not quite sure yet. And that's part of what I'm doing. And I'm also 
trying to measure and look at this object through different energy ranges. So I'll be doing the same deconvolution process, but in different energy ranges and comparing its size through this energy dependent brightness profile. This bigger hump that you're seeing in all three lines are the pulsar wind nebula. The little bumps could be the supernova remnant shell, we're not quite sure. And each line is different energy ranges that I'm measuring it through. And that's what I'm doing currently. So why do deconvolution through new star? Is it just to get nice looking images? Yeah, but there's, there's more to it than that. The real main goal is finding a way to view objects in higher energy ranges and see them in higher resolution. That would be amazing. We could see them in different light and we can apply this to not just new star, but maybe even future telescopes as they come, future X-ray telescopes. More physically, we can better analyze how the objects such as pulsar pulse wind nebulae or even black hole, supernovae, galaxy, we can better analyze how these objects work, and take another big leap into understanding how a universe works as a whole. And that's why I'm happy to do what I did this summer and still doing. So I wanna thank the Maria Mitchell Association for having me as an RAU intern. I also wanna thank my mentor for the summer, Dr. Melania Ninka for a nice summer. And I'm taking questions now from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Devin. That was fantastic. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, put them in the Q&A. Um, while we're waiting, um, I'll actually ask you, um, I'm not sure if, let me just check if we have a question in the, uh, we have lots of great jobs going on in the chat. Um, if anybody has any questions though, feel free. Um, Devin, do you want to tell us a little bit more about how big this object is, this pulsar wind nebula that you're studying, and maybe how far away it is from us? Sure. Yeah, so we don't know exactly how far away this object is, but astronomers are saying it's roughly 20,000 light years away. And that's where it's with the pinkest circle in this image on the right that you're seeing is the pulsar wind nebula. And that is a measurement that you're seeing in my notes on the side. It's around 5.5 times 10 to the 11th meters wide. So it's a pretty big object in like the meter scale. And the supernova remnant itself, like the bigger bubbles around five times that amount. Great. Um, we actually have a question from Emma who is asking, um, is the nature of X-ray observations that, sorry, let me start yeah. again. Is it the nature of X-ray observations that makes them blurry or is it something unique to new stars? Yes, yeah, so that's a good, very good question. So that is actually, if I, go, if I go back, that's actually unique to New Star because telescopes like Chandra have what's called a small TSF or point, point source, um, point source, I forget the F, but has a very small TSF and it can have this very nice looking high resolution image. Whereas New Star specifically does not have a very small PSF, has a very blobby and huge PSF, which means its images are very blurry. So to answer your question, yeah, it's, it's a problem with New Star. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see if anybody else has a question, feel free to pop it in. And again, if not, um, and you didn't have a chance put your question in we will be taking general questions at the end again so just note it down awesome thank you so much Devin no problem okay um, next up we have Sarah Graber who is uh, from Columbia University and Sarah is going to be talking to us tonight about discovering x-rays from RV tau variable stars awesome let me presentation. So hi everyone, I'm Sarah. Um, this summer I've been working with Dr. Rodolfo Montez from the Harvard Smithsonian CFA studying RV tau variable stars and with a focus on x-rays which I'll get into in a second but um, first I wanted to give a quick overview of what a variable star is. So on the most basic level a variable star is a star whose brightness fluctuates over time, often in a repetitive pattern. So you can see this GIF here. Um, it's cycling through different images of a Cepheid variable, which is another kind of variable star. 
um, as getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer over time. And the kind of star that I've been studying is a different kind of variable star called an RB tau. So RB taus are yellow supergiant stars. They're tens of times bigger than the sun. You can see a little size comparison. <laughs> um, and they are thousands of times brighter because they're so big. But they're pretty old stars, and temperature-wise, they're a lot cooler than our sun is. Uh, they're called RB tau after the first kinds of these stars to be found, which was RB tauri in the constellation Taurus. And RB taus have a very specific light curve, which you saw some in Alex's presentation, that is just a measure of how bright a star is over time and how it changes. And the specific pattern that RB taus have is that they will have a small dip in the light curve and then a big dip. And all of these light curves demonstrate that. These are all RB tau light curves. And that happens over a period of like one to five months from big dip to big dip. And these light curves are measuring visible light, like that our eyes can see. Um, but instead of visible light, I've been this summer studying x-rays. And x-rays, like Devin just talked about, um, are a very they're on the shorter wavelength, high energy end of the spectrum. And there aren't really a ton of X-rays floating around in space because mostly they're only emitted by what we call high energy objects. So that's things like black holes and neutron stars and supernovas, these like really energetic phenomena or objects that produce a lot of heat. And then that heat produces a lot of X-rays. Um, most stars produce some X-rays, but not a lot, and they're kind of weak, so you can't really see them at a distance. And that's the same for RB Taus, where they've never been characterized by any kind of extreme X-ray emission. There had never been um, any RB Taus targeted by a major X-ray observatory either until Yuman. So Yuman is a nearby RB Tau star, and in 2016 it was targeted by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And this is my plot of that data from 2016. So this is an X-ray image. And the color bar on the side here that goes from zero to around 60, that is counting the number of individual X-ray photons in each pixel of this image. So like the number of X-rays that the telescope is seeing. And so the background has like zero to 10, it's just like noise levels. Um, but the source has around 60. So that was really cool, that was exciting. We don't really know yet what they're coming from. <laughs> they could be coming from the star itself. They could be coming from, um, Yuman has a binary companion, so it's two stars orbiting each other. They could be coming from the companion star. It could be coming from something else entirely that we're not thinking about yet. Um, and my advisor is part of the team that first published these results, and they're trying to get more RB Taus observed in X-ray, but that's a long bureaucratic process, and so in the meantime, I'm here, and instead of waiting on new observations, I've been going through archival data. And so here's a breakdown of the work I've done this summer. Um, I've gone through archives to look at 45 different RB Tau stars across around 350 different observations, so like individual image files, um, coming from three different telescopes. And if you add the exposure time of all of these images together, it comes out to around 150 days of exposure time. So that's a lot of data. And basically what I've been doing is looking for RB tau photobombs. So I'll have an image of something like this. So this is not an x-ray image. This is visible light. But you see this nova in the center here. That's a high energy object. So it's been photographed by multiple different x-ray telescopes. It's also right next to an RB tau star. So I can look at the x-ray data for this nova, you can see it in the center here. And up in the corner is where the RB tau star should be. And so if I zoom in on that region and check it out, I can look for signs of X-ray emission coming from that location. And the reason that I picked this particular image out of the 300 odd that I <laughs> analyzed this summer is that in this image, I think I found something. So, this is only a preliminary um, detection. There's still a lot of analysis to be done on this image and on other data for this star. But if we confirm it as a detection, then it's only the second detection of X-rays 
from an Argy Tau star ever, which is pretty cool. So now I will show you the zoomed in data for this, this star. Ta da! <laughs> so when I first showed this to my parents, they were like, oh, you got, you got some, some rectangles. That's cool. And I don't blame them because this might not be a very impressive image. You might not be able to tell what you're looking at. And that's just because, as I've learned in the summer, there's just not a lot of x-rays out there. Um, this color bar, again, on the side, is counting individual x-ray photons. And the highest number is three. So the most photons in any pixel in this image is three, which is crazy. Most of the background doesn't have any x-ray photons at all. And when you see these like gray single photon squares, that's probably just background noise. Um, but so in the center here, where it has three photons, that's comparatively a lot. And the fact that they that there are multiple dark pixels clumped together in the center is also important. Um, it's also good to note that this star is way on the edge of the image, and the telescope is going to be less sensitive on the edge. It's also going to, like Devin was talking about with the, the point spread function, PSF, I think that's what it stands for. Um, it is going to warp things on the far edge of the chip. And so that might explain this round shape here because of the telescope. And so um, this star, there's a lot of analysis left to be done on it. Here's a picture because it's very pretty. Um, there's also 351 more observations to go through and double check for anything else that I'm missing and to anal an analyze further to see if there is anything that is not visible to our eyes very clearly. Um, so this larger project is far from done, but just to wrap up for now, takeaways um, about X-ray astronomy in general, there aren't a lot of X-rays in space. So when you see a lot of them, it probably means that there's something interesting going on. Either you're looking at a high energy object, which is just inherently cool, um, or there's some unexplained reason why an object is emitting X-rays that you wouldn't expect. And for orbitals, we don't really know yet <laughs> why they would be emitting X-rays. Um, and between archival data and new observations, we're going to try and figure that out. And that could tell us more about every tell stars themselves, it can tell us more about their binary companion stars, and just in general um, will give us more insight into the later stages of life for these stars and stars of their size. So thank you all for your attention. I hope you've been enjoying the presentations. It's been a really good summer. Um, and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. Um, we actually have a question um, from Todd. And Todd is wondering, um, do we know what causes the fairly regular spikes of high and low energy from these stars every five months? So I think kind of why, why do they vary? What's the yeah. yeah, yeah. OK, I have a backup slide for that. So you said that variable stars vary in general is like complicated and it has quantum physics in it. And I don't. But like the simplified version is that um, stars are pretty large. These stars are large and they're cooler on their outer layers, which makes it want to contract. And as it contracts, the pressure ionizes helium in the star's outer layers. And that ionization makes the star heat up, which makes it expand again. And then the helium can deionize and the star cools. And so it has this cycle. For RB tiles with the small dip, big dip pattern, that we don't really know <laughs> why that happens. Um, there's theories that it has to do with resonant frequencies. Um, like when you like blow over a bottle and it makes a noise, that's like a resonance. But this would be a 3D version of that with the whole star where it would just have that specific pattern. Um, that's another thing that we're, that not me, <laughs> but people who know things about quantum physics are, are looking into that. Great. Um, we have a question from Celia, who's actually asking, in the SDSS image, I think that one that you showed there at the end, there appears to be a galaxy to the right of the star. How yes, can, there is. Yes. Um, her question is, how can you tell that the X-ray detection is from the star versus the galaxy? Good question. Um, 
And honestly, we're not quite sure yet because like I said, the edge of the chip might be kind of distorted. And so um, we're running analysis on um, flux from different points in the image to try and make sure that we're lining up um, the right points with the right sources. Um, the x-ray data, I don't have um, an image that zoomed out in this presentation, but the x-ray data for the larger um, field here does have some x-rays coming from over here. Um, I'm not sure if that would be from a super active AGN kind of x-ray. Um, what was looking into that? Great. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, uh, Kaylee is wondering, did you find any other pixel groupings along the edges of your most promising Chandra image with about three photons similar to your RV tau candidate detection? And, uh, and was this spot unique in the image? It's not unique in the sense that um, there are many places in the image that have three photons um, because there are many other sources. So like here you can see down here, these little dots that are kind of stretched out are distinct galaxies. Um, and there's some intense X-ray emission coming from that place. Like there's um, some AGN back there, um, galaxies that are putting out a lot of X-rays. Um, so there's lots of other sources in the image that are putting out X-rays. Um, the part of the reason why this we think is significant is because if you look at like this pixel up here, it has two, so that's a lot too, but it's all by itself. There's nothing around it. But the fact that these are clumped together makes it more likely that there is one source submitting a lot of x-rays at that point. Awesome, thank you. Um, Louise is wondering, um, if you were there looking back at us, would you see x-rays? Um, if you knew from our sun, nope. Um, if you were at the nearest star to our sun, you would not see any x-rays. Um, and I think Devin, maybe what was Devin mentioned is that x-rays don't even get through Earth's atmosphere so from, from our sun so it's pretty it's pretty weak from our sun and I suppose thankfully for for life <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, awesome thank you so much Sarah um, that was it for the Q&A but if if other people have questions please feel free to um, hang out until the end and we'll go back and answer any other questions thank you um, next up, we have Andrea Mejia, who is from Hunter College, and she's going to be telling us about using fast radio bursts to untangle the cosmic web. Thank you so much, Regina, for that introduction. And um, let me share my screen with you. And hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about the research that I've been doing this summer with Dr. Regina Jorgensen and Jay Chidity, uh, uh, which involves uh, taking data uh, from the Very Large Telescope found in Chile and using it to study and analyze the galaxy from which a fast radio burst emanated from billions of years ago. So before I unpack all of this and get into the particularities of my research, let me just give you a brief description of what a fast radio burst is. So a fast radio burst, which I'll refer to from here on out at certain times uh, as FRBs, are brief, highly energetic pulses of radio light that propagate through intergalactic space before they reach our telescopes. They release more energy in one millisecond than the sun does in 80 years, which is pretty mind boggling. Now this animation that I'm about to show you uh, gives you a nice uh, visualization of what a fast radio burst looks like. So this galaxy is just, just expelled this radio light into outer space. And we see this light traveling at different wavelengths through, uh, through the universe. And so as this light travels through the universe and it inter and hits uh, gas and other charged particles found in the universe, it undergoes something called dispersion. And so that the longer the wavelength is, which is what you see the, the red droplet, uh, the more it interacts uh, with, with this matter, more so than the, the purple and the blue wavelengths. So that by the time this FRB reaches um, our Earth, after having traveled millions or billions of light years across the universe, 
the, the longer wavelengths actually arrive almost a second later than the shorter wavelengths. And so once we receive the signal, we're able to plot out the signal and, and witness the dispersion um, that the, uh, the FRB underwent as it went through the universe. And so this dispersion is going to be very important for my research. So the way I calculate how much the dispersion, um, how much dispersion this light underwent, I can calculate the slope of the signal. Now I want you to hold on to that image and I want you to hold on to this dispersion measure um, uh, for, for later that uh, where I'm going to get into why this is so important for my research. Okay, so back to the FRBs. We don't really know much about them, to be honest. Uh, we know that some repeat, we know that most don't, and we really don't understand why. Uh, we don't really understand the physical mechanisms uh, that cause these uh, highly energetic events to occur in the first place. So, okay, then why even bother studying uh, something that we have no, really nothing to go off? Well, it turns out uh, astronomers uh, can really uh, use these FRBs. They're, they're actually a useful tool for us to use. Um, so uh, much like our ancestors, right, that used sticks and stones uh, for food and shelter without really understanding how these sticks and stones came to be in the first place, uh, astronomers are using FRBs much in the same manner as a tool, specifically as a probe to untangle the cosmic web. Now the cosmic web is just a, a model that describes how matter is distributed throughout that universe. And cosmological observations show that the universe is made up largely of dark matter, followed by, uh, excuse me, dark energy, followed by dark matter. And lastly, about 5% of ordinary matter, which is the stuff that you and I are made of and the stuff that we can see in the universe like stars and galaxies. But there's a problem. We can only detect half of that ordinary matter. The other half has somehow gone missing or is just hiding in plain sight. So what FRBs can do is they can act as a flashlight so we can see that stuff that's hiding. Okay, so remember I told you to hold on to that dispersion measure that I was speaking of in the video? So the dispersion measure is important because we, in order to find that missing matter, uh, we have to first find out how much the whole, the galaxy from which this FRB came from contributed to the dispersion of that radio light. In order to do that, um, my, my data is going to actually be able to do that. So the stuff that contributed to the dispersion of this light from the FRB uh, was contributed by the host galaxy, followed by the cosmic web, which is ultimately that's what we want to know. And we know how much stuff is in our Milky Way that contributed to this dispersion of light. Okay, so this is a, a three-dimensional image of a host galaxy. Uh, this is uh, basically how data comes to me through an uh, instrument called MUSE that's mounted on the, on the Very Large Telescope in Chile. And so what this allows me to do is because the mu splits up the, the, the light from this galaxy into its different components, I'm able to move through the data and, and study this object at different wavelengths, much, much like turning on your television and tuning into a channel at different frequencies, something like that. So in order for me to get the dispersion measure of my host galaxy, which will give me the dispersion measure of the cosmic, uh, of, of that was caused by the cosmic web, I have to look at the light uh, from this galaxy. So here it is. Here's my beautiful galaxy where this FRB came from. That little circle in the center, that's where the FRB emanated from. It looks like it's, it's embedded in a, what seems to be a gaping hole, uh, but it's really just my galaxy. And so what I was able to, and so what I'm, first what I wanted to do is I wanted to study the light from that region. And that's, this is a, a, a some spectra of, of this area and the dotted, uh, this dotted uh, square here. That's the spectrum from where the FRB came from, of that part of the galaxy. Next, I wanted to analyze a different part of the galaxy just to see the difference between where the, the gas that makes up 
where the FRB came from and the gas that makes up a different part of the galaxy. And this is it. This is a sum spectra of that part of the galaxy that's in the blue red, uh, that's in the blue square. And so here is where my analysis begins. And so on the left side, you see the spectra where the, the FRB came from. And on the right hand side, you see the spectrum of uh, that center point, the blue rectangle uh, part of the galaxy um, and showing it as a, a graph of brightness uh, according to its uh, wavelength, uh, brightness versus wavelength. And so what I wanted to see, which astronomers do a lot, is to study the chemical composition uh, of the gas um, in this galaxy. And what the chemical composition is gonna do is gonna tell us a lot of information, a lot of physics behind this galaxy and the physical stuff uh, and physical properties that makes up this, this, this galaxy. But the most important thing, as you remember, that I want is that dispersion measure. And so the hydrogen peak, this the hydrogen that's peaking here and here is what's gonna give me that estimate of the dispersion measure from the host galaxy. It's gonna give me that number that I need in order to get the in order to get the dispersion measure of the cosmic web, which will give me, which will map out where how much matter, how much matter uh, this light went through in the cosmic web. That's the PS de resistance. That's what I want. Um, so this dispersion measure of the cosmic web will give me that amount of missing matter. Now I haven't gotten to that calculation yet. But I, this is basically my jump off point, and this is basically what I'll be doing next in my research beyond the summer. Okay, so to summarize, FRBs are really cool and really interesting and very powerful and bright, but we don't really understand them a whole lot. So instead of trying to, uh, as, as enticing as it is to try and uh, 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 study this enigma uh, uh, of event, we're actually using them as a tool, specifically as a cosmological probe into uh, the, uh, to untangle the cosmic web. And I really hope that uh, you've uh, enjoyed this talk on Fast Radio Burst and how I'm using it. And I really wanna thank this amazing team of uh, the Fast and Fortunate FRB follow-up team that I have joined uh, this summer that has been so nice and welcomed me into their group. I particularly want to thank Dr. Regina Jorgensen and Jay Chidi for their mentorship this summer, for the MMA, for this amazing opportunity. Um, I only wish that I could have been there in person, but at last, I'm so glad that uh, I was still able to go through this journey. And I want to thank and give a shout out to uh, my cohort peers as well. Thank you. I'm open to any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Andrea, that was great. Uh, let's see, we have one um, question in the Q&A. Um, Brian is wondering, what drew you to studying FRBs? And, and I'll just put in a little comment here that Andrea actually um, selected, when we, when we come up with the slate of projects each summer, we give the students a choice, we, we provide them with abstracts and we let them rank and have some choice in their preferences. And Andrea actually ranked this project very, very highly. Yes. Yes, I was super excited to get on this uh, subject. Thank you so much, Brian, for the question. I'm, really, I'm always happy to talk about uh, and geek out about, about this stuff. So when I first got this abstract, uh, I was immediately drawn to it because of uh, how much mystery just surrounded uh, these events. And I am, I am very much a sucker for the mysterious. <laughs> So I really felt like this was an opportunity uh, to delve into, uh, into other parts of astronomy that at, up to this point, I haven't really delved into. Up to this point, I've been really working more on black holes and active galactic nuclei. So it was such an amazing, it was such, it was more theoretical work. So this work was, uh, uh, was very much different um, from the theoretical work that I was working on. And so, um, yeah, when I saw the, uh, the abstract that Dr. Regina Jorgensen sent, um, I immediately was drawn uh, to this project and I just, I'm so glad I, um, that I made this choice. <laughs> um, awesome, we have one more question. Um, Abby is saying, hello, Andrea, a great presentation. How did you choose the region to compare to the FRB? Was it an arbitrary square in the region or a specifically interesting part of the galaxy? That's such a great question. Um, 
honestly, it was just a, a random arbitrary point in the galaxy. Uh, eventually, I'm going to want to plot the, the spectrum of the entire galaxy. Uh, and that's going to give me a lot more details about the galaxy in terms of uh, its rotation, its morphology, uh, uh, really it's uh, um, how much star formation is happening in this galaxy in different parts of the region. Um, so this is just like a, a stepping stone in that direction. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, let's see, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A right now. Um, but if you still have a question, feel free to hang out and we will take questions for everyone again at the end. So thank you very much, Andrea. That was great. And um, next, we have our final speaker for the evening, um, Natalia Villanueva of Harvard University. Hello, and um, Natalia is going to be talking to us tonight about exploring the optical emission of 22 tidal disruption events. Yes, let me share my screen. All right, so thank you for that introduction, Regina. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Natalia, uh, and this summer I worked with Dr. Suvi Jazari on a project exploring the optical emission of tidal disruption events. Uh, so first, let's start off by talking about what a tidal disruption event uh, even is. Uh, so this event starts off with a star uh, coming too close to a black hole. And too close means within what's called the tidal radius, uh, which is, is this orange uh, circle here. And this tidal radius plays an important boundary between two big gravitational forces at play here. Um, there's the star's self-gravity that holds it together. And then there are the black holes tidal uh, gravitational forces. And so what happens when the star comes too close and within this tidal radius is that um, the black holes tidal forces are able to overcome the star's self-gravity and cause the star to rip um, and be pulled apart like you see right here. And so the star is then disrupted um, into this stream of debris that is going to orbit and orbit and orbit around the black hole until it eventually gets eaten up by the black hole. And so what I'm gonna show you here is a pretty cool simulation of this whole process. Um, and this simulation is of a white dwarf. Um, so a low mass star getting disrupt, uh, tidally disrupted by a medium sized black hole. And what you'll see happen is um, the white dwarf will come too close to the black hole, which you can't see the black hole yet, but you will be able to in a second. Um, but the star will come too close and get ripped apart into that stream of debris that we just talked about. And that stream of debris will start off on this very elliptical orbit um, around the black hole. And as the stream keeps orbiting around the black hole, you'll see that the orbits get less and less elliptical and more and more circular as the uh, stellar debris starts forming this accretion disk structure um, around the black hole, which you can think of like a whirlpool uh, funneling in that stream of debris into the black hole. Uh, so this is that initial disruption right there. And now it's starting off on the very elliptical orbit. And in a second here, the, yeah, the stream is now falling onto the black hole. And now you can tell where the black hole is. Um, and the stream is going to keep orbiting around. And in a moment, you'll be able to really see how, how the orbit has gotten a lot more circular. Um, so you can start to see that here now. That orbit has gotten a lot more circular, and there is the beginning formation of the accretion disk that's going to feed the black hole. Um, so now if we talk about this graphical representation of that whole process that you just saw in the simulation, um, what you're seeing here is the accretion rate, um, so how fast the black hole is eating up that material off of that accretion disk that formed around it. Um, and how that rate is changing over time. And in fact, uh, simulations like the one you just saw are able to predict how these trends um, go. And so um, they're able to predict them with uh, kind of input properties uh, like this black hole mass here. And so the really main takeaway I want you to get from this figure um, is that the decay from this peak accretion rate follows a very characteristic 
uh, t to the negative 5 thirds power law decay. Um, and so that's the really important piece from this figure. And now if we talk a little bit about how we observe these tidal disruption events or TDEs, um, we observe them happening at the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. And when they happen, they emit these huge amounts of radiation uh, in this really big flare, and that's what we observe. Um, so we've observed them in the ultraviolet, uh, radio, x-ray wavelengths, um, but for my project this summer, what we were focused on was the optical or visible light observation of these TDEs, uh, specifically in the green and red colors, so GNR filters. Um, and so we used the 48-inch Palomar Austin Schmidt telescope on Palomar Mountain in California to do this. This is a picture of it here. And this telescope is part of the Zwicky Transient Facility, also called ZTF. Um, and ZTF specializes in observing transient phenomena, so events or objects that flare um, in space. And it's good at this for two main reasons. Uh, the first being it has a very wide field of view and very frequent observation. So, um, it's able to observe the observable northern sky, so about 15,000 square degrees, every three nights. Um, so that gives it about a 47 square degree field of view. And what that um, means is that it's able to catch flares that pop up quickly, and it's able to track their progress well. And so those are two very important things when observing transients. Um, and the second reason ZTF is good at observing transients is because it carries out this process called difference imaging, uh, which I have a cartoon of here. And so what difference imaging is, is that if uh, we were to take an image of this uh, area of the sky right here, right now with this galaxy and this flare, um, and we were to take this image right now, difference imaging means that we subtract from this image that we just took another image of the same area of the sky, and this image was taken sometime in the past, um, and this image has no flare. And so when we subtract these two images, all we're left with is the flare um, that just happened. And so that's really uh, the main thing that we, we were interested in observing anyways. So um, that's the second reason that ZTF is good with transients. And so what we do with this flare observation and the other observations we'll take over time is we see them in a light curve plot, um, which a few people have already talked about tonight, so I won't go into that. Um, but here is an actual example of one of the tidal disruption event light curves. I, I plotted and analyzed, and here's the name of that tidal disruption event up here. Um, and so we have the brightness going up the y-axis and the time since peak here on the x-axis. And all that means is that the peak of the flare has um, been aligned with zero. And then we have the green and red um, or GNR filters. And so this is a pretty general shape actually for what a tidal disruption event light curve uh, looks like. So we have three main features that are present in any tidal disruption event light curve. Uh, we have a well-defined peak here, we have a pretty steep rise to the peak, and then we have a power law decay from the peak. And this black line here is this power law decay, um, specifically with a t to the negative five-thirds power law, um, which is pretty typical of tidal disruption events. Um, and so the first step in analyzing these light curves is really making measurements of these three features we just talked about. And these measurements are very useful for, first of all, describing the shape of the light curve. And um, the, the cool thing about the shape of the light curve is, so this shape is built up by the, by the observations of that optical emission that is emitted by the, by the TDE, right? So um, the shape then also represents whatever physical mechanisms um, create that optical emission. So the shape is really useful in investigating what those physical processes in the tidal disruption event are that are causing the emission that we see. Um, and so uh, that shape and the measurements can also help us learn more about the TDE system, so about the black hole and the star that was disrupted, and can also help us constrain models, um, and those models are the ones that explain what those physical mechanisms creating the emission are. And so another big part of our analysis of the light curves um, this summer has been the creation of these four uh, different classifications for the shape of the decay. And so the reason um, we did this was because uh, the sample that I was looking at this summer of tidal disruption events 
um, that sample is really one of the first samples that have such a have such a long uh, data coverage going out from the peak. So, so that means that they've really been observed for a long time after the peak. And that's one of the first instances, instances that that's happened in, in the kind of history of, of TDE observation. And so um, there were a lot of new structures and new features to unpack and look at in the decay um, because they had never really been seen to that detail and extent before. For. Um, and so how we kind of organized what we found was by creating these four different four different categories. And so the first one here, the power law, um, I showed you the, this light curve a few slides ago. This is the general shape that we expect. Um, and so this is the power law again, the T to the negative five thirds power law, um, a very smooth decline in brightness. Uh, but then we get into some of the features that we found and we were pretty surprised for. Um, or surprised about. Uh, so one of them being this rebrightening late in the decay. Another being this very bumpy behavior, um, which is just so interesting because it doesn't follow at all the smooth power law that we expected. And then finally, uh, this plateauing behavior, uh, which basically if, if this power law that we expected to see were to keep going, um, we'd expect it to keep declining in brightness, but instead we're seeing that the observations show a plateau or a leveling off in brightness. So it doesn't follow this power law that we expected. Um, but so these classifications have been, have been really useful in highlighting how these features um, that were unexpected that I found in these di different light curves, um, how different they were from the power law decay that we expected. And so um, if you remember me saying that the shape of the light curves are very much influenced by the physical phenomena that causes this emission that we're showing in the light curve, um, these unexpected features uh, can really add information uh, that we can use to kind of help improve and, and make our explanation of what those physical mechanisms are uh, more comprehensive to take, to take these unexpected features into account. And so to kind of uh, wrap up and recap some of the points that I've talked about today. Um, first of all, we talked about how uh, this summer I've been analyzing the optical difference imaging light curves of 22 tidal disruption events from the Zwicky Transient Facility Survey. And here I have kind of like a collage of those 22 light curves. Um, and second, uh, we talked about how the first step in that analysis has been measuring the shape of the light curve. Uh, so that we can constrain models and get more information about what is physically powering uh, that optical emission that we're seeing. And finally, we just talked about how um, I have basically categorized the shapes of the decay into the classification scheme of four categories, um, and those really highlighted uh, the deviations from the T to the negative five-thirds power law decay that we expected. And so future work uh, really involves digging further into those measurements and seeing what else they can tell us about the, the TDEs that we're looking at. And so that means looking for correlations between the, the shape of the light curve that we measured, um, the other properties of the TDE, like peak luminosity, the mass of the black hole, um, the makeup of the star that was disrupted, and other things like that. So um, there's quite some work still to be done but it's it's a very exciting field and i've been so excited and fascinated to learn the ins and outs of tidal disruption events this summer and i hope after this presentation uh you guys are all at least a little bit excited too um so yeah a big thank you to dr suvi jazari for being my mentor and showing me how cool of a field this is um and also to regina gary j uh, the other interns for really making this an awesome summer um, i'm so happy i was able to be part of this and so, yeah, with that, um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, we do have a couple questions already. Um, let's see, um, Celia is asking, could some of these unexpected results be caused by residuals from the image subtraction? Good question. Um, so I'll go back to kind of see these different features. Um, so the, these, these 
points that I have plotted here, um, they've really, they're, they're what we call detections. So there's either kind of an upper limit data point that we can have, which is basically that the, that the error on that point, um, especially kind of after that difference imaging subtraction, um, the error there doesn't really justify it being uh, considered like a true data point. So that's why it's an upper limit and, and uh, we're able to kind of see trends there, but we don't uh, consider them kind of very, very heavily when we're, when we're really doing the measurements and all of that analysis. Um, but so all of the points here are detections and you can see the error bars around them too. Um, we're pretty confident that these are from the event itself. Yeah. Awesome. Um, let's see, Rudy has a question and is asking um, the green data of ZTF oh, uh, 19 AAPREIS. He was looking very closely at, okay, that one um, seems to decay faster than the red points. Why is that? Um, so I'm not too, I have seen that also in some other events that I've analyzed, and I'm not too familiar with why there might be a difference uh, between the two, between the two colors. Um, I believe it may have something to do with uh, kind of the, I guess the dynamics of, of how the light came to us from these events. Um, so I think, I think one of these, uh, sometimes these events can experience some, I think it's like a blue shift kind of. Um, so that may be, if I'm getting that correct. Um, but yeah, I'm not too clear about that, but that's my best guess as to why. Okay, great. Um, Kaylee, we have a couple more questions. Kaylee is asking, um, what physical phenomenon uh, may have caused the three types of non-power law light curves? All right. Yes, great question. I have a backup slide prepared for this. Um, so there are kind of two schools of thought about what might be powering the optical emission and especially why it's different from the, the power law decay. Um, and and these two ideas um, haven't been so robustly developed based on those uh, four different categories. So um, the four categories and the new data I analyzed still have to kind of be incorporated into these uh, discussions. But basically the two schools of thought are that there might either be some reprocessing material um, that is kind of shielding the tidal disruption event. And so what that means is that since these are such high energy events, um, it's kind of expected that they emit in a high energy wavelength like an X-ray. And so it's thought that if there's this envelope or shield surrounding the tidal disruption event, um, that shield is causing, um, as the X-ray emissions are coming out and going through that shield, um, it's causing those emissions to be bumped down in energy as they travel through the shield uh, to the optical or visible light that we're observing. Um, so these, the shield kind of structure could be formed by some sort of outflow or wind that's coming out of the accretion disk. Um, but then the other school of thought that's a little more favored in the literature right now um, is this idea of stream stream collisions. And so um, this figure kind of explains them a little bit. If you think of these dots as uh, different streams traveling um, in an orbit around the black hole, uh, so when these streams come around and they bump into each other, uh, that can create some shocks. And those might be the optical uh, emissions that we see. So um, it's still pretty early in this investigation and there's still a lot to learn, um, especially with all the new features that we've seen. So that's what's thought right now, at least. Awesome, thank you. Um... We have one more question right now. Um, Georgia says, great talk, uh, two related questions. Number one, do you see other flares in the data that are not from TDEs? And number two, how can you tell which flares are TDEs and which maybe are other things, especially if many of your TDE plots had unexpected features like rebrightening or bumpy or et cetera, and, and it is the power law curve that helps identify TDEs? Okay. Great questions. Um, so one of the things that do happen when we get all of these observations from ZTF and other surveys that are similar um, is that all of the observations go through this um, like vetting or, or I guess uh, checking for false positives um, in the data. And so um, some other events or phenomena that could be easily confused with uh, TDE is something like a supernova or an uh, active galactic nuclei. 
And so uh, there are certain features of the observations um, that make it possible to tell them apart. Um, so especially if uh, there's spectroscopic follow-up, so meaning um, if we're able to collect data on the spectra and the chemical makeup of, of that area of the sky. And so, yeah, um, follow-up kind of tests like that and looking at the observations um, can make it possible to tell that difference. And uh, particularly for the uh, power law, I'm not sure about that um, because I'm also not too familiar with how the light curves of a supernova or active galactic nuclei might look like. Um, but I, from what I think, uh, I think the supernovae might be more easily confused with, with the TDEs in that regard because I think the trend might look a little bit similar, but uh, don't take my word on that because I'm not yeah, again, I'm not too familiar with what those light curves look like, but there are some vetting procedures to be able to tell them apart. Great, thank you. Um, let's see if anybody else has um, any questions and I'm actually going to, um, at this point, maybe just open it up if anybody has any questions for any of tonight's speakers, um, feel free to, go ahead and um, either raise your hand or put them in the Q&A. I see somebody um, has just asked a question. And so um, it looks like this question is actually for Alex. Um, Katie is wondering, um, Alex, can you speak to what other targets you might want to study with existing and or future data from tests? Um, yeah. There are some interesting shaped uh, light curves that I was looking at that uh, I think would be cool to figure out like different eclipsing, eclipsing binaries with white dwarfs um, that are interesting, but didn't really follow up on them because they were ruled out as a, as a um, transit. So I think that'd be fun. Awesome, great. Um... Does anybody else have any questions? Again, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A or, or raise your hand and uh, if you'd like to ask a question. Um, we have lots of people saying thank you. Um, all of the presentations were fantastic and um, while while we uh, wait just one more minute to see if anyone else has a last minute question, um, I'm just going to tell um, everyone, um, first of all, thank you all um, who have attended tonight. Um, we really appreciate your support for the Mariah Mitchell Association and everything that we do here. Um, and um, I personally am very happy that we have been able to um, have this REU program run this summer um, under very different circumstances than we normally do it. Uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge, but um, I want to thank all of the interns who have just really gone in full hearted and, and done such a great job under very difficult circumstances. And, um, you know, I, I am so impressed with all of the research that we got done um, this summer. And so I want to thank you all and thank you for all the hard work that you've done. And these presentations were just fantastic. Um, so let me just see if anybody else has put anything else in the Q&A. Um, I don't see anything. Um, so I suppose with that, um, I will just say thank you to everyone for coming. Um, thank you to all of the interns for all your great work. Thank you to the affiliated astronomers for um, all of your hard work mentoring. And um, thank you again to the NSF for supporting this program through the REU grant um, that we have been fortunate enough to get. Um, and so with that, I guess we will sign off for tonight. And um, in case you did miss anything, uh, we will be posting a recording of this on our YouTube channel, um, probably by tomorrow or so. So feel free to check that out and share that with your friends and family. And um, just I'll make one more note that uh, our next Science Speaker Series event will happen next Wednesday at 7 p.m. And it will be focused on um, the invasive green crabs. So um, I think that is um, all for astronomy tonight. And um, so thank you so much and have a good night. Bye-bye.
Oh yeah, everybody turn your cameras on. Good point. Yay. Actually, if you unmute too, you can say, there's Jay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you all. That was super awesome. You all rocked it. That was really, really awesome. Great job, everyone. Um, and I'll be sending out an email shortly. So check your email. Okay. <laughs> all right. Have a good night. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.